Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first webinar by Postcolonialisms Today. My name is Heba Khalil, and I'm a working group member of the Postcolonialisms Today project. Postcolonialisms Today is a policy research and advocacy project on development policies and initiatives adopted or formulated by governments and policy institutions across the African continent. Um, it focuses on the immediate post-independence period. The project applies feminist and heterodox approaches to economics to recover the key policies that sought to address the material and cultural limitations imposed by colonial regimes and identify ideas that can be use, uh, usefully adopted um, to ongoing development challenges to Africa today. Two months ago, we were supposed to be holding our first political exchange on the continent in Nairobi. When the outbreak of COVID-19 made such an in-person exchange impossible, we decided to continue as best as we can with the goals we had for the Nairobi meeting. In particular, we wanted to introduce the project and its analysis, particularly the research findings to a wider audience. Um, in addition, we want to build an exchange and and uh, collective strategizing with new allies so as to kick off the advocacy phase of this project. Today's webinar is titled Lessons from the Decolonization Era in Responding to COVID-19 and it's part of this effort by the project. The goal of this specific COVID-19 webinar will be to engage with current thinking and responses around the COVID-19 crisis. At this critical moment, we can put forward lessons and examples from the post-independence era that are applicable and also um, discuss the deeper structures across the continent which must be transformed. This is a moment when the cracks of neoliberalism are being exposed again as they were exposed, for example, in the 2008 financial crisis. This provides an opportunity to intervene, but there is no assurance that neoliberalism won't come back stronger from this crisis. That's why this is a moment uh, to be vocal about the cracks of neoliberalism. This webinar will be the first in a series of online discussions and outreach efforts. Subsequent webinars will be thematic and likely not focused on COVID-19. Um, our plan with these is to bring in new allies, build relationships, especially those we had planned to meet in Nairobi. This will happen in addition to other work such as Africa is a Country articles um, and producing a series of videos. So um, without Further ado, let me introduce to you Tete Hormeko Ajay uh, from Third World Network Africa. He's also a working group member of Postcolonialisms Today. Uh, Tete will be speaking today on the value of looking back to the post-independence era and the policy gaps evident under the current COVID-19 crisis. Thanks a lot, uh, Haba. Um, the thing that I'd like to say, you know, in this short present, you know, presentation, is a point that, um, as we all know. African governments have, over the past three months, taken some policy measures in response to the global pandemic that we are facing. And as we all know also, they have faced a lot of challenges in those measures. Now it is, we believe that some of the things that has been done to correct those things that have been exposed in their policy measures, and that we, there's a lot, of, a lot that we can learn from what African governments did in the, in the past uh, to help redress those measures. So my presentation is basically going to try and connect some of the things that we found out in the post-colonialism today project, especially the research that we carried out, to the policies undertaken by immediate post-independent African governments, and what we can learn from them to try and address the gaps and the challenges that African governments have faced over the past three or four months as they have tried to respond to this global pandemic. One of the most uh, striking features of what African governments have done over the past four months is the expanded role of the state, the, the state in general and governments in particular. Like governments everywhere in the world, African government has stepped up to play a role across the board roles that even a week before the pandemic struck would have been seen as heretical, as unacceptable. But the government stepped up to play a catalytic role, to step in and to say, mobilize resources, to make sure that uh, human, financial, institutional resources were available to address those public health emergency. They've also, where there's, they've stepped in the breach 
to actually catalyze action by other people, things that government are not supposed to do. It's also private sectors will be catalytic. Above all, they have actually shown that they are the collective leverage around which the whole of society can be mobilized and generate a common will and purpose to address a common issue. They have played a very important coordinating role for the whole of society. And this is very striking, as I say, because even two weeks before that, if you have said, everybody will have said, especially new liberals will have said that it's the market which coordinates things and government should stay out of their way. The unfortunate thing, as we all know, however, is that in spite of these measures, African countries could have done much, much better. It turns out that even as they did these things that we were pleasantly surprised about, they were not very well equipped to do what they were doing. They suffered a lot of institutional deficits. There's a lot of social problems and their capacity to command the legitimacy of the whole of society was lacking. Um, that caused a lot of problems. It was not simply because the, over the past 40 years, the state has been demonized and has been told that there's no role to play in society. In Africa in particular, there were deliberate attempts taken, in fact, positions taken to dismantle the state, to dismantle the institutional capacity of the state, to dismantle the social infrastructure of the state, to dismantle the cadre capacity of the state, so that the state actually is not, was not in a position to do the things that it found itself being called upon to do. And this has expressed itself across a number of ways. And I'll just use a few examples to show this. For instance, institutional capacity. The Ghana government, for instance, made the right decision that it has to supply food to the poor and vulnerable during the lockdown. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to, to maintain themselves. So you got the food. But how to distribute the food to the poor and vulnerable became a problem. The institutions of emergency management were not up to the task. So you had this paradox that people were assembled together in mass meeting places and stayed there for them to collect their food, undermining the very social distancing that was required by the health crisis. Mm. Okay. Now, this, was not, this shouldn't have happened if the states and its regional and local government structures were intact so that local government could have taken up itself to be able to distribute food to the people in need in the places in need. There's, in addition to institutional incapacity, there's also the, the weakness of social infrastructure. Medical facilities, are, for instance, were lacking. In Ghana, at the time of the crisis, there were only a couple of places where I, emergency care units were available. So the state now have to scramble around creating makeshift ICU. And it's not simply Ghana, all of Africa was the same. It's not simply in medical facilities, which have suffered for years of being downgraded and privatized and lack of investment. It's also just providing uh, support equipment, for instance. So when African governments found that they had to supply personal protective equipment for the frontline staff, they discovered, of course, that they are going to be on the, on the, at the end of the queue, <laughs> importing uh, PPEs, because, of course, we have the brigand of Donald Trump, who just going about the well, seizing people who have you know, it made their import orders on the high seas. So it, it became clear to African government that if they're going to supply PPEs to their frontline staff, they have to make them themselves. In Ghana, we discovered that to do that, we have to run into the gamble of the fact that we have not invested domestic productive capacity over the past year. Now, the government did a lot by mobilizing private sector and helping to write, redirect them and focus on sewing masks and, and things like that. But it has not been adequate. And up till now, frontline health workers still lack the adequate PPE so that people are actually going on strike. They are refusing to serve at the time when the, 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 the virus is spiking. If you go away from medical infrastructure, finance, the government's states, which have resources at their disposal, almost all of a sudden found that they didn't have their money. Um, and they very soon began to ask for the international community to help them uh, relieve the burdens, to supply their money, give them uh, emergency support, uh, get out of their crisis. Now, they didn't have to do that. If they had the appropriate mechanisms in place, they could have stopped capital, which was in their country, from flying away. 
But because they didn't have the mechanism, people just took their money out of the economy, even in times of emergency. So they didn't have to scramble and beg for money. What they lacked in financial so resources also meant that they didn't have the fiscal space to take policy that they have to take. Fiscal space and policy space. Because really, the ability for the state to command their resources depended upon the state saying that I want these resources to go here and this other place for the purposes of public use. But having undermined the policies, capital controls, allowing people to take money in and out as they wanted, it didn't have the capacity even to act like that. So, so we had a range of these problems. And in fact, together with this thing, what was the biggest problem for the state was the, the fact that its legitimacy then was, was, was undermined because really, when the state was scrambling to distribute food to people, when the state was scrambling and was not able to provide protective equipment to frontline workers, then it couldn't command the, the belief and confidence of ordinary people that it could supply for them. And therefore, very soon, when the people should stay at home, people began to say, that I have to go out and work. So people began to defy the order. And then the state had this knee-jerk authoritarian reaction to try and use the police force, the military, to get people to stay. And that was the, the, the beginning of the unraveling of those policies. Ultimately, this limitation that, that we found about state capacity, state institutions, state resources, policy space, fiscal space, are all rooted in the structure of our society and our economy. Economies which are structured to be dependent in the international order, as people who just produce raw materials and export them for the purpose of importing everything that they needed. That kind of economic dependence also came with the political dependence and a lack of policy space, which meant that our state could not act. Now, these are the range of things that have been corrected. If going forward, we are going to build societies which are resilient and able and equitable that can command the loyalty of all the citizens so that we can face our, our woes and issues together in the future. Now, to do this, we don't, fortunately, we don't have to, to go outside anywhere and borrow ideas from anywhere. We, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Because it turns out that the very things that we have to do, the very deficiencies that have been exposed by COVID, were things that Africans themselves, not too long ago, were doing, were putting in place, that if we learn from them, we can then you know, you know, apply them. We, and we have the confidence that African will actually do them. And that is the signal lesson that the post-colonialism today's project, especially its research, taught us. And that is the biggest relevance. And this is why we thought that we should be able to, to uh, showcase this uh, research and project in this time of the uh, uh, corona crisis. And again, let me just give a few examples about how the post-colonial and post-independent states acted. For a start, there was the, the, there's no argument at all that the state had a central role to play in reorganizing societies which have just emerged from years of colonial rule and colonial destruction of their, of their, of their autonomy. So the state was going to play a central role in helping to reorganize and, and take society towards the future. But it was a social contract between state and its people. If the state was going to be able to meet certain needs, okay, and the people also were going to participate and lend their energy. So everybody was together unlike today that we have. That social contract was translated in terms of intervention in a range of areas which are relevant today. For a start, in the area of social services, let's take health, right? Now, it is interesting that in Ghana, and I'm sure in many other African countries, the hospitals that were built in, in the immediate post colonial times are the same hospitals now that are existing. Uh, after years of disinvestment, it was only those hospitals that we have now that we are scrambling to use in the COVID crisis. Uh, the commitment by the government to provide free health service to their people and therefore build modern health infrastructure has stood at the test of time. And it's not simply in health, they need to be water, in education, et cetera. Beyond the social services, they also of course invested in, in, the, in the, the economic development infrastructure. And the most important area of this one is the fact that they thought that the, the, the economies must be equipped to begin to produce for our people and to re reorganize the primary commodity you know, syndrome, a pattern that they got from colonialism. So 
there's a broad question of industrialization. But industrialization was expressed in the fact that Africans must be able to manufacture and produce things in different areas. In fact, so in addition to just health services, there's also state investment in pharmaceutical companies, which were actually investing in making medicines. In Ghana, it was interesting because the state investment, the state pharmaceutical companies was combined with the attempt to modernize traditional herbal medicine and knowledge so that they can go hand in hand together. And this is important because in fact, there are many, many areas that people know that traditional health practices can actually step in and complement in the search for a cure and a response to corona and other viruses as we have found out. But it's not simply, beyond the pharmaceuticals, there's investment in many, many areas so that we have state enterprises, state industries, et cetera, which are hoping to build productive capacity. In the area of finance, the, the government was quite clear that the wealth that was being generated in their economies had to be used and reinvested in their economy. So they adopted financial institutions and financial measures that ensured that the wealth was available to be reinvested in the economy for expansion. And it's not simply things that we know, like you know, development banks, a central bank that was related to development, but actually credit that was made available and targeted even to the most vulnerable sectors, rural economy, for instance, or rural banks targeted to them. Above all, it was that they also understood that they had to intervene in ensuring that they protected the economy within the international economic order itself. Because after all, the most important thing to have told is that it was not simply a question of building a modern economy. To do that, people have to reorganize what they inherited from colonialism and reorganize their place in the international order. Because after all, they knew, they knew that they want political independence, they have political sovereignty, but that political sovereignty has to be complemented and rooted in economic sovereignty. Sovereignty over their resources, sovereignty over their people, sovereignty over their knowledge. So in important areas like minerals, uh, natural resources, uh, agricultural resources, the stake took a stake in ensuring that those things are available for the, for the people's development. So all over Africa, whatever the ideology of the government, whether it's in Nkrumah's Ghana, or Kaunda's Zambia, or Botswana, and avowed capitalist countries, all the governments nationalized the mineral resources in their country that belong to the state. And then they took the appropriate steps to negotiate the terms within which foreign investors can participate in the exploitation of those mineral resources in a way that could lead to development and benefit for the people. So it was really an accession of sovereignty, which was seen as critical to reorganize in a, in a continued fight against the, the legacy of colonialism, what, what some of the most radical call neocolonialism. Above all, as I, as I said, this was also something that was a compact between state and people. Now, this is not to suggest that everything that the post-colonial governments did in the 20 years after independence between 1960s to 1980 were all straightforward and correct and can easily be applied to our modern times you know, without any problem. No, no, no. The, the, the point of the post-colonialism today's project is to acknowledge that there are lessons that we can learn from the past, which can be the starting point for addressing the issues that we face today because those policies were much more faithful to the reality of African economies and, and the challenges that they face. That those policies were much more faithful also because they were driven by the desire to assess sovereignty. They were driven by the desire to get the people involved in it. But they made mistakes and they made errors. In fact, the errors in the ways in which the population themselves, the different sectors of the population, whether it is ordinary people, whether it is gender-based discrimination and exclusion, all of them undermine the ultimate uh, sustainability of their policies. And we think that it's our duty in postcolonizing today's project to take those less, to those policies, process them, and apply them to our times. So, so, so in summary, therefore, COVID and the responses that our governments have made to them, laudable as they are, have exposed a lot of gaps and deficiencies that requires for us to go forward, to plug those gaps, to reorganize our economy so that we can be more resilient. And to do that, we think Africans have a lot that can, they can learn from their own past. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Tete, for uh, presenting this very important framework uh, to thinking about the relevance of uh, post-colonial African governments and their policies uh, for the current uh, African continent, particularly uh, in light of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, now we can start uh, our thematic panels and we will start with our first panel on industrial policy. So let me introduce to you Jihen Chandul. Uh, from the Tunisian Observatory of the Economy. Jihen is a working uh, group member of Postcolonialism today, and she will be speaking on agricultural policy and the clear need for food sovereignty um, that the COVID-19 crisis has demonstrated. Bonjour à tous. Um, mon intervention uh, va essayer d'apporter quelques réflexions sur uh, le secteur uh, agricole, sur l'agriculture à la lumière de la crise économique et sanitaire actuelle liée au Covid-19, et spécifiquement sur, sur les pays africains. Donc il est clair que euh, une des leçons euh, que l'on peut tirer de la crise actuelle, c'est que euh, les pays africains sont extrêmement dépendants des importations pour nourrir leur population, euh, et on peut euh, voir par exemple que par exemple en Afrique de l'Ouest, 40% du riz consommé est importé, pour ne citer qu'un exemple. Euh, L'agriculture est également dépendante des intrants euh, agricoles nécessaires à la production et donc par conséquent euh, dépendante aussi des euh, devises nécessaires pour importer. Donc euh, on voit aussi que les, les, les États, plusieurs États ont pris des mesures de, de restriction. Euh, donc, euh, par, parmi lesquels la fermeture des frontières aériennes, terrestres et maritimes, ce qui a eu pour conséquence d'une part de baisser les importations et donc de perturber les chaînes d'approvisionnement. Et par exemple, les pays, par exemple, si les pays exportateurs de céréales et de denrées alimentaires de première nécessité euh, qui sont aussi touchés par la pandémie cessaient brusquement de produire, tous les pays dépendants de ces importations se trouveraient dans l'incapacité de nourrir leur population. L'autre problème euh, important qu'a révélé euh, la crise actuelle, c'est que euh, également en Afrique, il y a très peu de produits agricoles transformés. La plupart des États euh, donc, ont une agriculture axée sur les monocultures de rente et destinée à l'exportation, ce qui est aussi un héritage colonial important euh, qui a perduré et... Euh, on voit qu'elles euh, se retrouvent dans un cercle vicieux où euh, elles exportent des, des produits agricoles non transformés euh, qui sont, bien sûr, les prix sont dépendants aussi euh, euh, des, des prix des marchés mondiaux, donc des prix très volatiles. Et donc, euh, ils sont dépendants de ces, de ces exportations pour avoir les ressources euh, en devise nécessaires pour acheter certains produits euh, alimentaires essentiels. Donc euh, la plupart, enfin, les, 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 pays les pays africains sont des pays euh, importateurs nets de produits alimentaires et euh, on voit que euh, cette dépendance et cette fragilité de, du secteur agricole impacte directement non pas seulement les revenus de, de l'État et les ressources en devise, mais également les revenus des agriculteurs. Euh, sans parler des couvre-feux, des fermetures des marchés, des fermetures des écoles, des restaurants, des, des commerces, les mises en quarantaine des villes ont complètement aussi perturbé les chaînes d'approvisionnement locaux. Et euh, les, également, les, les, donc les producteurs en fait, se, sont, euh, se sont retrouvés euh, face à, euh, voilà, à, leur, à, à, à des denrées alimentaires périssables euh, sans déboucher. Et euh, quelques rares acheteurs euh, sont en fait bien connectés à certains producteurs, mais la plupart euh, se sont retrouvés dans une situation où ils ne pouvaient plus vendre euh, leurs leur, leur produits alimentaires. Euh... Donc cette crise a aussi révélé euh, des, 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 comment dire, des, des manques criants en termes de... de, comment dire, de de logistique, de transport, euh, d'isolement en fait de, de certaines régions euh, marginalisées et, euh, et donc tout ça a contribué à une crise hein, et à une baisse des revenus des producteurs 
euh, qui sont pour la plupart en fait des petits, euh, des petits agriculteurs. Et euh, cela met en péril aussi le, la, la, les prochaines récoltes, puisque euh, il y a aussi une, 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 un manque en, dans tout ce qui, dans, en termes d'intrants euh, aussi pour les, pour les prochaines récoltes. Donc, euh, donc on est face à une vraie problématique qui nous pousse en fait à réfléchir au, au système alimentaire. Euh, et à la production agricole en Afrique en vue de développer des, des, systèmes, qui sont, euh, des systèmes alimentaires durables, plus durables et une, 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 production, une, enfin, une agriculture familiale plus résiliente. Et, euh, et, 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 et en fait, ce, ce débat n'est pas nouveau. C'est pour ça que je pense de l'intérêt de, de, de notre projet aujourd'hui, c'est également de faire un parallèle et de puiser euh, dans les leçons que l'on peut tirer des politiques qui ont été expérimentées juste après l'indépendance, euh, dans les années 60-70, où justement il y avait euh, des euh, dynamiques politiques dans les différents pays africains en vue d'atteindre ce qu'on qu qu nommait à cette époque l'autosuffisance alimentaire. Euh, et euh, justement, enfin, c'est ce... L'autosuffisance alimentaire, c c c enfin, la première préoccupation euh, post-indépendance, c'était de mettre en place des politiques pour nourrir sa population de façon autonome à partir de ses propres productions et de également euh, développer un secteur agricole euh, euh, important avec, euh, des, avec forcément une, une, des emplois aussi décents. Et il y avait une, 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 dynamique, euh, une dynamique dans ce sens-là qui a été euh, ébranlée de plein fouet dans les années euh, 80-90 par les plans d'ajustement structurel, euh, pour faire euh, vite, mais euh, les plans d'ajustement structurel ont ébranlé cette notion d'autosuffisance alimentaire pour la remplacer par la notion de sécurité alimentaire. C'est là, je pense, où il y a une vraie réflexion à faire entre... Euh, entre trois concepts qui sont l'autosuffisance alimentaire, la sécurité alimentaire et la souveraineté alimentaire, et de bien les différencier. Et la sécurité alimentaire qui a, qui a pris le pas en fait, à, aux objectifs, euh, aux objectifs euh, prioritaires euh, dans les contextes post-indépendance, où il y a eu des euh, tentatives de mettre en place des coopératives agricoles, comme en Tunisie, euh, il y a eu plusieurs... plusieurs euh, euh, tentative de mettre en place des, des politiques d'autosuffisance alimentaire euh, qui, qui, ont, euh, qui, ont, qui ont échoué. Mais je pense que là, l'intérêt aussi de notre, de notre projet, euh, c'est d'essayer de, de, de d'explorer ces tentatives, d'explorer ces politiques qui ont été mises en place dans le contexte post-indépendance afin de voir euh, quels sont les facteurs qui ont fait, qui ont fait échouer ces, ces, ces tentatives et de tirer des leçons pour mieux euh, pour mettre en place ces politiques dans notre contexte actuel, qui, des politiques qui sont complètement euh, d'actualité et qui sont en fait euh, indispensables euh, à mettre en place. Et, euh, et justement, en fait, et de, de revenir à un concept euh, beaucoup plus... Euh, beaucoup plus comment dire, pertinent dans le, le contexte des pays, de, dans le contexte des économies africaines, qui est le, le concept de souveraineté alimentaire. Donc par opposition à la sécurité alimentaire, qui elle signifie qu'un État, enfin, elle, elle, la sécurité alimentaire ne, ne porte pas d'importance, ne souligne pas l'importance de, euh, de la production agricole propre à un État. Donc peu importe si un État ne produit assez... De, de, de produits agricoles ou de produits alimentaires pour nourrir sa population, ce n'est pas ça ce qui importe. Ce qui importe, c'est qu'il puisse euh, à donner accès à une, à une nourriture ou des, à des produits alimentaires à des prix abordables, que ce soit par importation ou autre. Donc par exemple, Singapour, qui est un, une, un des pays qui était classé comme le, le, le plus sécuritaire, on va dire qui, qui assure le plus en termes de sécurité alimentaire, euh, il, faut, il, il faut savoir qu'il ne produisait que 10% de, sa, de, sa, de, sa propre, de ses propres produits à, à consommer. Donc, euh, donc, par opposition à ce concept qui est clairement basé sur euh, les politiques néo néolibérales de, 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 finalement de, 
d'importation par substitution en fait à une production euh, réelle des produits agricoles et qui renforce les capacités productives des États, euh, on a plutôt une euh, voilà on, 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 pardon on, 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 l'objectif de cette réflexion est de revenir vers le concept de la souveraineté alimentaire qui est un concept euh, qui est un concept beaucoup plus euh, pertinent dans notre contexte qui, qui a été défini par la Via Campesina comme le droit des peuples à une alimentation saine et culturellement appropriée produite avec des méthodes durables. Donc la, la, la souveraineté alimentaire, contrairement à la sécurité alimentaire, place en priorité la production agricole locale pour nourrir la population, l'accès des paysans à la terre et aux ressources naturelles, ainsi qu'aux semences et aux crédits, et met en lumière également le droit des petits agriculteurs et agricultrices à produire et le droit des consommateurs à décider ce qu'ils veulent consommer. Donc euh, ce concept met en fait au centre euh, l'agriculture le, 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 familiale et paysanne qui est euh, l'agriculture majoritaire dans les pays africains et elle le met au centre pour nourrir la planète. Et euh, cela renvoie une, à, une type à un type d'agriculture diversifié en opposition à l'agriculture industrielle qui tend, elle, vers une production en monoculture vouée à l'exportation. Et cette agriculture familiale permet à la fois de nourrir le cercle familial, mais également d'alimenter les marchés locaux. Donc c'est plutôt basé sur des circuits courts. Euh... Et enfin, elle renvoie aussi à une autre, à une autre, une autre, comment dire, une autre priorité, qui est l'agriculture durable, et l'agriculture biologique. Donc c'est vraiment une agriculture qui se nourrit à la fois des savoirs traditionnels, mais aussi des innovations écologiques récentes. Donc la crise aujourd'hui de Covid-19, qui a entraîné une crise alimentaire également, en plus d'une crise économique, euh, nous pousse en fait à réfléchir, à revoir les politiques agricoles dans les contextes africains, à tirer les leçons des des politiques, des prémices de politiques visant l'autosuffisance alimentaire euh, dans, en, en, après les, dans les années 60-70 et, et euh, nous pousse en fait à, à, comment dire, à plaider pour des, des véritables politiques de soutien pour un secteur qui a été abandonné par les États euh, et qui, euh, qui a été abandonné par les États et pour lesquels euh, programmes d'ajustement structurel ont aussi réduit drastiquement les subventions. Les programmes d'ajustement structurel dans les années, années 80-90, mais également actuels, les conditionnalités aujourd'hui des prêts de la Banque mondiale euh, poussent encore, ou, ou, les, ou les interventions du FMI plaident encore pour une réduction des subventions en, au, auprès des agriculteurs euh, pour, euh, pour réduire les, 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 les budgets. Et également, les accords commerciaux en fait, qui sont négociés euh, entre, entre les pays africains et les pays euh, comme l'Union européenne ou les États-Unis, aussi, euh, il y a une véritable lutte contre euh, les subventions, qui sont les, des politiques de soutien au prix, vis-à-vis euh, -vis des, des petits agriculteurs. Donc, euh, il y a euh, une véritable réflexion en fait, à, 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 à mener sur ce terrain-là, et à revenir à des politiques euh, et des interventions ciblées qui garantissent l'accès aux ressources euh, essentielles pour l'agriculture, la, pour telles que l'accès au financement, l'accès à la terre, l'accès aussi à la technologie, euh, re, à, à réfléchir aussi à l'usage des ressources euh, telles que l'eau, qui, qui, qui est une ressource en compétition aussi entre euh, deux secteurs clés dans la plupart des contextes africains, qui sont les industries extractives et l'agriculture, euh, il, y a, il, y a, il est très important aussi de revenir vers des politiques orientées vers l'économie agraire des petits exploitants qui, et, qui visent à améliorer leurs conditions techniques et matérielles de production et euh, quand, quand, quand on parle de, 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 de technologie c est, c est, c est, ça inclut bien sûr tout ce qui est services d'irrigation les services de vulgarisation de formation, d'appui technique euh, qui, qui, ont, qui, qui ont été comment dire, qui ont été drastiquement euh, réduits, euh, qui ont été victimes en fait, des politiques d'ajustement de, 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 euh, structurel et des politiques néolibérales euh, dont on a été témoin. Donc, euh, donc il est important de revenir en fait, à des politiques d'investissement et des politiques de financement euh, 
active euh, dans le secteur et de miser sur la transformation des produits agricoles en Afrique pour que la valeur ajoutée reste en Afrique. Euh, et ça, ça va permettre de développer également des secteurs plus productifs, de créer des emplois à valeur ajoutée, de créer une véritable économie région, locale et régionale, et euh, tout, en, euh, tout en liant le secteur agricole à d'autres secteurs, de secteurs clés. Euh, donc voilà, euh, il est donc euh, important de, de soutenir cette réflexion, et je pense que nous avons une opportunité euh, aujourd'hui, hein, avec euh, Covid-19, de plaider, de pousser ces politiques dans les différents États, euh, dans les différents États africains. Et au Sénégal, il y a actuellement une réflexion au niveau euh, étatique euh, avec plusieurs économistes sur euh, une révision des politiques agricoles en vue de mettre en place la souveraineté alimentaire. Donc c'est vraiment euh, des politiques qui, pour lesquelles il faut que l'on pousse et, euh, et, et, et il faut qu'on le pousse aussi dans le, dans le contexte africain. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Jehan, for this important intervention. Uh, part, food policy and food production is particularly problematic, I think, globally, not just on the African continent in this moment. So it's really important to reflect um, on these issues. And now I, I present to you Omar Ghannam and Karim Megahit from Social Justice Platform Egypt. Omar and Karim are researchers with the Postcolonialism Today project mm -hmm. and will be speaking on industrial policy and improving domestic capacity to manufacture important goods, particularly during the pandemic. Omar and Karim, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Heba. Uh, in preparation for this session, we thought that a good starting point would, would be uh, a reminder of the aim of the research, which, which is not to defend Nasser's regime and its entire policies, which is an accusation we got used to a lot during our undergrad years whenever Nasser was discussed. However, the aim is to highlight some of the progressive socioeconomic policies that we, found, that we find in his, that his regime implemented. And, and we understand that the entire experiment was not perfect. There were a lot of internal limitations that proved fatal to the, to the experience at the, as a whole. However, these uh, socioeconomic rights is so important to, uh, to revisit, especially at these moments, because the failure to maintain these policies and to further build on it uh, led to the triumph of uh, uh, new liberal policies eventually, starting with Sadat's uh, open, uh, economic opening and later Mubarak, Mubarak's uh, facilitations to the new, new liberal transformation. So uh, yeah, while the, while the disclaimer about not being uh, Nasser diehards uh, seems misplaced for our international audience, uh, we felt it's important for, uh, for our, uh, like for whoever reads our work in Egypt, because in Egypt the conversation around Nasser and around his programs are very poor, polarized. Uh, and it's very important for us to, to, to convey that we, we are trying to strike that balance of uh, giving him credit for what he did right and still not absolving him of what he did wrong or what he failed to accomplish. Uh, and since the paper is quite long and we don't have a lot of space, we thought we could address uh, the, the main connections between uh, our work and what's happening now in the form of bullet points that guide the conversations. So uh, each of us prepared some bullet points about what we would like, uh, what we think is a salient point for what, we're, uh, for what is happening now. Uh, and we'll just address them uh, back and forth. Uh, as we go. So, uh, first up uh, is a point that, uh, the last point that we added is uh, financial resources and medical scarcity. So, uh, Egypt's continued problems with hard currency uh, and generally vulnerable economic situation means that whenever there is uh, a problem with the valuation of the pound, wherever, whenever hard currency is difficult to come by, uh, medical supplies that we import become very scarce and it can affect people's lives in a very real way. Uh, I've had at least two major uh, experiences with this, one in 2003 uh, when, the, when the valuation of the pound was 
was a problem and members of my own family couldn't find uh, medication that they need to survive, to, to, to actually live. Uh, and it happened again uh, last year as after 2016 and the devaluation of the pound in the aftermath uh, of the rescue loan uh, meant that a lot of medication that is imported into Egypt immediately became scarce and impossible to get by. Uh, and that's a recurring problem uh, since Egypt up until now needs to import a lot of the medical supplies that it needs. Uh, so that's just a quick headline thought. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have something to add on this? Or? Okay, so uh, this leads us to one of the main points of the project. So since the project mainly deals with uh, self-sufficiency as a core tenant, and it focuses on an internal orientation for the economy. The economy should be run to fulfill the people's needs. Uh, when that collapses uh, and Egypt becomes subjugated to the global, uh, yani reintegrated into the global uh, capitalist order, we are integrated into the global value chains uh, that kind of became the hallmark of neoliberalism where each part of the product is manufactured somewhere else. Now, with COVID-19 and uh, the limitations it put on both production, uh, yeah, people's access to production facilities uh, and also movement of goods and services uh, across countries, uh, the fragility of global value chains became specifically exposed. Uh, and we see a lot of countries actually suffering from that issue and worrying that uh, they are not actually in control uh, of the uh, of production of their most uh, precious needs. Uh, we we all heard uh, I think we all heard about the PPE pirates, the personal protection equipment pirates. Uh, the reports of uh, mysterious uh, people showing up uh, on uh, on airport tarmac, and buying, supply, uh, buying supplies at double or triple the market rates. Uh, and that's, kind of, that's, that's the thing that happens when uh, the value chains are so uh, concentrated in one area where the original production takes place in one area and most of the other world serves as a consumer, uh, unable to produce its own needs. That puts, uh, that puts us in uh, an auction kind of uh, situation where the highest bidder ends up with the equipment and the poorest countries uh, such as in Africa end up uh, with the scraps yeah. or without the personal protection equipment they need whatsoever. Yeah, and it's good, it's good to remember that Egypt, uh, Egypt at the moment imports around 60 to 70 percent of its vital food needs from abroad. So with, them, with all of this Corona situation, uh, we, um, we we cannot be in control. Right. So uh, to go back to the project itself, as it relates to uh, healthcare uh, and the management of health. So uh, the provision of universal healthcare was a core tenant of the project. It was a very important part of uh, the social contract that was uh, written in, that, uh, in the project's context. That is the provision of uh, basic, uh, basic, need, basic needs such as healthcare, education, housing. Uh, that universal healthcare coverage at that point uh, played a very important role in raising the average life expectancy, improving the general health of Egyptian. Uh, it saw the last uh, epidemic outbreak uh, with cholera. Uh, it, uh, it starts significantly working on reducing the, uh, the incidence of other endemic issues to Egypt, such as Bilharsia and other issues. Uh, we, all, uh, we also saw when it came to pharmaceutical industries, uh, in the paper, they are, uh, of course, grouped under chemical industries. We see the regime actually giving them special attention. We see that uh, between 1952 and 1967, the workers in these in establishing uh, in establishments uh, working in chemical production increases fourfold uh, within the span of 15 years. Uh, the gross value added increases uh, seven, by 700 uh, percent. 
and average workers' uh, growth value added increases by roughly 67%, which is a tremendous achievement for the time. We also see a significant uh, reduction in uh, a significant reduction in uh, reliance on uh, on importation as the domestic production ratio of total supply uh, increases from roughly uh, 50% in 1947 to over 60% by 1967. So the the regime wasn't successful in com making it completely a completely indigenous industry or a completely self-sufficient industry in Egypt. Because as Karim mentioned earlier, we do have serious internal limitations when it comes to, to, to that field of industry specifically. But we do see significant improvement uh, in Egypt's self-sufficiency when it comes to uh, medical needs. And going back to the point of the universal health care, uh, the, the social contract that Nasser uh, that Nasser offered and the healthcare it offered was not perfect, but still looking at now, looking now at today's situation where most of the medical services are provided by the private sector and only recently after the government imposed uh, certain prices on the services related to the corona, most of the private sector providers withdrew and refused to, contain, uh, to maintain uh, providing for the corona uh, patients. So, uh, yeah, that drives us to our next point, which is centralized planning from production to provision. So, uh, during the Nasser's regime, we, uh, we delve into that quite uh, a bit in the paper, uh, where we talk about what is central planning, what is centralized planning, what is developmental planning. So, the centralized planning of production for medication ensure that Egypt would, uh, like in a situation like ours, it would have ensured that we would have the medication or the personal protection equipment that we desperately need in this situation. But also the centralized planning of provision that is in the form of government-run public sector uh, hospitals, which used to be the, 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 the primary form of healthcare that most Egyptians had access to, that is until uh, healthcare became uh, more and more dominated by the private sector, uh, especially during the 90s and the early 2000s. Now it's estimated that a little over 50% of Egyptian uh, uh, of hospital beds in Egypt are owned by the private sector. Uh, the prices that have been since COVID-19 started, we saw an almost complete collapse of the Egyptian health uh, healthcare system. Uh, daily you would hear news, see news uh, about people who are desperately trying to get their relatives or their parents into, uh, into the proper facilities but they can't sit. The, hospitals, uh, the hospital beds are either not there or incredibly expensive. We've seen uh, prices that go up to $3,000 a day uh, for, uh, for admission uh, which is roughly uh, the average GDP per capita for Egypt uh, in a country where about a third of the population uh, makes less than a thousand uh, makes less than three hundred dollars a month so that is you are asking someone to pay effectively their yearly earnings for one day in a hospital which is not only morally reprehensible it's also uh it also means that these people can't access the care they need which means that they they are going to suffer from complications they might die and they are going to spread it even more they are going to it's going to exacerbate the crisis uh do you have anything to okay so uh Another aspect that uh, we've seen but we have been unable to exactly quantify in Egypt is uh, gender-based violence and gender-based discrimination. So we've been seeing reports from all around the world that uh, during the lockdown and curfews and all of that, incidences of uh, domestic violence have been increasing, especially as women are trapped with their abusers. Uh, this also has been exacerbated by the problem of rising unemployment in a lot of countries where people have been, where there have been significant layoffs. 
in Egypt, uh, about a third of households rely on uh, income generated by women. Uh, and in all of these households, they are the primary breadwinners. However, most women in Egypt end up working in the informal sector where they have no formal protections, no unemployment benefits, uh, no pensions or severance packages, basically nothing. So uh, this actually exacerbates the problem as women who, are, who do not have the financial means or the material means to escape abusive relationships, to be able to provide for themselves and their kids a place to stay away from their abusers, are effectively locked in with their abusers, allowing them no, no viable way of escape. So this is an area, again, where we see that uh, although the Nasserist regime wasn't some uh, revolutionary feminist uh, project, and it did preside over what we uh, resigned to call a public patriarchy, it still guaranteed significant rights for women that have been rolled back since then. We've seen significant uh, changes in the attitude uh, of society towards uh, working women, uh, their presence in the workplace, and what rights uh, should be granted. Uh, that's, I think that's it for this. Uh, yeah. Do you have something? No, no, you finish it. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so, generally, uh, as we, Yanni, as it relates to COVID-19, uh, with what it has done to the global economy, Egypt generally works on a semi-rentier economy where we end up relying uh, on tourism for generating about 20% of our GDP. Uh, and a lot of uh, our hard country that we desperately need to import our needs, as Karim mentioned, uh, we import a lot of our food stuff, we import a lot of necessary medical supplies, uh, and we import uh, a lot of uh, intermediate uh, products that we need for our factories to run. Uh, so when uh, a crisis uh, of the scale of COVID-19 strikes and uh, tourism is effectively uh, wiped off, that creates a lot of issues for the Egyptian, uh, for the Egyptian economy on a macroeconomic scale. So you have, uh, you have a worsening poverty issue. The Egyptian government recently released its uh, as projections for the next year and the best case scenario is that we will see an extra four percent of Egyptians fall under the poverty line the worst case scenario will see ten percent more Egyptians for under the poverty line putting uh, putting the final poverty uh, rates uh, at the end of the year at around 44 uh, percent this is coming on the heels of Egypt already having had its poverty rate increase from 27 percent to 33 percent so we're seeing 10% of the people falling under the poverty line in less than a year. That is a massive devaluation in, in the quality of life and in, in, in people's ability to provide their basic necessities. Uh, the slight good news has been that the inflation rate, which in Egypt, Egypt has been at historic highs, uh, since 2016, uh, crossing the 30% uh, threshold multiple times, it has been at around 5%, uh, which means that the worsening poverty is not going to be exacerbated by inflation rates so far. But due to the constriction in uh, hard currency inflows uh, because of uh, the wipeout that happened in the tourism sector, Egypt is actually now seeking uh, a new international loan from the IMF and the World Bank and other international lenders, which will, see, uh, which will probably see another round of austerity, which is going to spike inflation again, exacerbating the problem. So we end up seeing ourselves locked into that, just that empty circle of increased poverty, worse, uh, worse revenues for the state, rescue loans, and then austerity measures that worsens poverty and just continues the circle. Uh, these vulnerabilities 
are projected to extend. We haven't seen it yet affect non-medical goods, but it is projected to seriously affect it. Uh, the, we, we see it's actually giving us a good uh, view of what Egypt actually produces uh, recently, as we see that uh, fruits that are usually exported are now being on the Egyptian markets, so that's driving their prices down uh, uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. But we also see other goods that we rely on importation for, such as meats, such as, uh, such as wheat, dramatically increasing, such as sugar even, since Egypt now imports a, a, a majority of, uh, uh, of its needs of sugar, which is a staple proper, uh, a staple uh, good for Egyptian. Uh, so I think in the end, what we're seeing is when the, the, the neoliberal approach of laissez-faire, of let everyone be and do whatever they want and the state shouldn't intervene, uh, intervene means that in, in, a, in a crisis situation like this, where the state has to intervene, where the state is the only actor that is actually cap capable of intervening in a meaningful way that can affect change, the state cannot do that. The st it, it has been hampered by years of effectively being starved as per Ronald Reagan starving the beast. Effectively has been starved, effectively has been uh, applied into incompetence uh, and inability to deal with societal problems, now it's asked to step and it doesn't have the resources or the capabilities. So we see the attitude that the government in Egypt is now displaying, which is, well, we did what we can. Uh, you guys are kind of on your own at this point, they which is largely the government's rhetoric. They are even blaming the people for not having the awareness or the consciousness needed to deal with the, with the virus. Which, so like uh, even s something as simple as surgical masks, uh, when the crisis started, they were being sold at half a pound a mask. Mm -hmm. uh, last time I bought, them, uh, I bought them, now I actually use cloth masks because they became too expensive. A single mask became about eight pounds, uh, a little over 50 cents, which is an insane amount for, for a regular Egyptian to pay. It was an insane amount for me to pay every time I wanted to go, uh, like to go out and get my groceries. And technically, I'm in like, I think I'm in the upper middle class income group in Egypt. So if it's a problem for me, imagine what it is like for the majority of Egyptians uh, who are actually asked to live on less than seven pounds a day. So a mask a day would literally exceed his daily budget. Yeah, the, the, not the minimum wage. The poverty line is set at 735 pounds, which is equivalent to, to what in dollars? Uh, so, uh, Less than $20? Something, no, uh, it's about $30? I think uh, some, somewhere around $30. I don't, sorry, I, didn't, I don't have the calculation already in my mind. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, I, th I think that's the short of it. Uh, sorry if we spoke too push. <laughs> Thank you so much, Omar and Karim. Um, I think the real opportunity of COVID-19 or the real opportunity that this pandemic has brought to us is the fact that it has um, united the kinds of issues uh, and highlighted the um, uh, similarities across national contexts because the, the, the challenge is becoming very real in different contexts. So I'm hoping that our audience who are tuning into this webinar, uh, even though your presentation is particular to Egypt and your analysis is particular to Egypt, they can take a lot of it and uh, really apply it to their uh, national contexts, not just across the African continent, uh, but also globally. Uh, what, so as you spoke, just one last bit. So uh, one of my favorite medievalists, he's called Patrick Wyman. He, he worked quite uh, extensively on the Middle Ages uh, and pandemics and major crises. Uh, and he, uh, he quite often says that uh, major crises, pandemics, uh, natural, natural disasters, they don't collapse systems or destroy them. They just expose the cracks that are inherent in the system. Uh, I think that's exactly what COVID-19 has done, as you said. It has ex 
it has exposed the cracks in a neoliberal system and how it would buckle under pressure. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. And it's absolutely our job to kind of further expose uh, these cracks and point to them and point to the alternatives, which I think is um, quite what, what this project uh, is trying to do. Um, so now we move from the industrial policy to monetary policy. And let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Shafiq Ben Ruin from the Tunisian Observatory of the Economy. He's a researcher with Postcolonialism Today, and he will be discussing monetary policy and how to secure the needed fiscal policy space across the continent, particularly to deal with the crisis and its needs. Hello, bonjour. Aujourd'hui, uh, mon intervention va se focaliser principalement sur les leçons de l'histoire que l'on peut tirer concernant le rôle des banques centrales dans le financement du développement, principalement dans les pays en voie de développement. Je vais essayer de tirer principalement quatre grandes leçons historiques pour voir dans quelle mesure les banques centrales peuvent jouer un rôle essentiel pour financer le développement de nos pays. La première grande leçon, et je vais commencer par des choses assez simples, c'est que le mandat de la banque centrale doit être principalement défini en accord avec les intérêts de la majorité de la population dans sa composition. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire Par exemple, si démographiquement on voit que la majorité de la population est jeune, alors il faut adapter une politique monétaire qui va dans l'intérêt de la population jeune. Si au contraire on voit qu'au niveau de la démographie, la population est plutôt vieillissante, alors il faudrait adapter une politique monétaire qui soit en accord, en accord avec les intérêts de cette population. Il y a donc un lien très fort entre la politique monétaire et la démographie du pays. Malheureusement, il y a très peu d'études qui ont été faites sur ce sujet. Il y a une étude qui a été faite récemment en 2012 par un certain James Bullard, qui travaille à la banque centrale, la Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, donc qui est une des branches de la banque centrale américaine, et qui a travaillé sur ce sujet. Et, euh, et le résultat principal de sa recherche, c'est des choses qui sont en général assez, assez faciles à comprendre, c'est qu'en général, les jeunes générations, au départ, n'ont pas d'actifs, et donc euh, leur principale source de revenus, c'est les salaires. Et donc ces générations, les générations jeunes en général, elles préfèrent des taux d'intérêt relativement bas, des salaires relativement élevés, et ça se comprend, et des taux d'inflation relativement élevés. Donc ça, c'est pour les populations. Ce qui ressort aussi de sa recherche, c'est qu'au contraire, pour les, relations, pour les générations plus âgées, bah déjà, elles travaillent moins. Donc forcément, les, les salaires relativement bas vont plus la ranger. Elles préfèrent aussi des taux de rendement plus élevés, notamment pour rentabiliser leur épargne, et donc ça veut dire des taux d'intérêt plus élevés. Et elles préfèrent une inflation relativement faible, tout simplement parce que ça va euh, appauvrir euh, leur, leur épargne. Donc ce qu'on voit en fait de cette recherche, c'est que il est clair que le mandat de la Banque centrale, centré sur une inflation faible, sur des taux d'intérêt élevés et sur des bas salaires, alors en général, ça fonctionne bien dans des populations plutôt vieillissantes, comme c'est le cas par exemple au Japon ou en Europe de l'Ouest. Mais la question c'est, est-ce que cela fonctionne aussi bien pour des pays à population jeune comme en Afrique, dans les pays arabes ou de manière générale dans les pays en voie de développement Ça c'est une des leçons un peu historiques qu'on peut tirer de, de nos banques centrales, c'est que c'est une des plus grandes erreurs que nos banques centrales ont faites dans les pays en voie de développement, et qui a consisté à mimer les modèles importés des banques centrales occidentales sans essayer d'adapter ce modèle aux intérêts de la majorité de la population, plutôt jeune, dans nos pays. Et donc, on a essayé de copier un peu ce qui était bien pour des populations vieillissantes, donc taux d'intérêt élevé, bas salaire, inflation faible, sans essayer de l'adapter à la population locale. C'est la raison pour laquelle, lorsqu'on est jeune dans un pays en Afrique, comme dans un pays arabe, on a l'impression d'étouffer économiquement. Et donc cet étouffement, il est lié aussi à la politique monétaire restrictive qui réduit en quelque sorte la circulation de la monnaie en la renchérissant. La deuxième leçon 
de l'histoire, c'est en ce qui concerne la, ce qu'on appelle en anglais « domestic resource mobilization », donc c'est plutôt la mobilisation des ressources domestiques. Et une des principales leçons qu'on peut tirer de l'histoire, c'est que le rôle principal d'une banque centrale se joue dans l'orientation des crédits bancaires vers les secteurs stratégiques comme l'agriculture, l'industrie, le climat, bref, les secteurs qui peuvent être productifs. Et donc pour pouvoir assurer une allocation stratégique des maigres ressources domestiques, donc en général on a quand même très peu de ressources dans, dans le pays, la banque centrale d'un pays développé, elle doit pouvoir assurer deux fonctions principales. Premièrement, elle doit renforcer son rapport de force avec les banques centrales, avec les banques commerciales, pour les inciter à orienter les crédits vers les secteurs productifs, plutôt que de les gâcher vers les secteurs spéculatifs ou non essentiels, tels que l'immobilier, l'importation de produits de luxe non essentiels. Pour les, banques centrales, pour les banques commerciales nationales, c'est plutôt simple à faire. À travers le refinancement auprès de la banque centrale, la banque centrale a un rapport de force assez fort. Par contre, lorsqu'il s'agit de filiales de banques internationales étrangères, celles-ci peuvent se refinancer auprès des banques centrales internationales sans forcément passer par la banque centrale nationale et donc réduisent leur rapport de dépendance à la banque centrale nationale. Ceci affaiblit le pouvoir de la banque centrale à orienter les crédits de ces banques internationales vers les priorités de développement de l'État. Historiquement, le moyen le plus efficace pour une banque centrale de forcer les banques internationales à se plier à sa volonté, c'est d'instaurer une forme plus ou moins flexible de contrôle des capitaux, coupant ainsi le lien entre ces banques et leurs sources de refinancement internationales. Le deuxième outil qui est souvent utilisé par les banques centrales et qui aujourd'hui existe, existe moins, c'est, disons, que la banque centrale peut mettre en place des, euh, des taux d'intérêt directeurs différenciés selon les secteurs, par exemple avec des taux d'intérêt plus faibles pour l'agriculture ou, ou des taux d'intérêt plus élevés pour l'immobilier ou l'importation de produits de luxe. Il y a encore certaines banques centrales qui le font, mais de plus en plus, euh, c'est, euh, disons, euh, un taux d'intérêt fixe qui, euh, qui, ne, qui ne différencie pas entre les, entre les secteurs. Une autre idée un peu oubliée aussi, c'est la mise en place d'une banque publique de développement qui agit en tant que bras financier de l'État pour financer les projets de développement de long terme, comme cela a été, a été utilisé dans l'histoire par des pays comme l'Inde ou l'Allemagne. Donc ces leçons ont été oubliées à la suite d'une victoire idéologique des institutions financières internationales qui ont obligé les banques centrales à libéraliser les flux de capitaux et à n'utiliser qu'un seul taux directeur en laissant le marché décider de la meilleure allocation du crédit avec le risque, bien entendu, que les maigres ressources à notre disposition soient gâchées vers la spéculation et non le développement. La troisième idée essentielle est souvent négligée dans le financement du développement, c'est au niveau, disons, de la conception des projets de développement. Souvent impressionnés par les Occidentaux, nos dirigeants et administrateurs ont privilégié des projets qui nécessitent une quantité importante de capitaux non disponibles localement et donc ont accru notre dépendance aux institutions financières internationales et aux investisseurs directeurs étrangers, aux investissements directeurs étrangers. Donc cela a eu pour impact principalement de faire primer la logique financière sur la logique sociale des projets de développement, avec une nécessité de retour sur investissement à court terme, sur des projets principalement qui nécessitent au contraire un temps long pour retrouver un équilibre financier. C'est en général une des raisons principales pour laquelle nos pays se retrouvent vite étranglés financièrement, étant donné que ne pouvant, par exemple si on prend des secteurs comme l'agriculture avec les aléas, etc., ne pouvant euh, comment dit, respecter euh, les, les objectifs de rentabilité à court terme, se, re, se retrouve vite étranglé financièrement et perpétue la dépendance au prix international. Enfin, le quatrième point qui me semble important, c'est que même si les projets sont bien conçus, il y aura toujours un besoin de financement extérieur. Et là, une des plus grandes problématiques de notre histoire, à laquelle nous avons été confrontés en tant que pays de développement, c'est celle des prêts internationaux avec conditions. Donc l'objectif de ces conditionnalités, à travers le FMI principalement et la Banque mondiale, a presque toujours été de maintenir nos pays dans une relation de dépendance financière en profitant de nos besoins financiers conjoncturels pendant les crises de liquidité pour changer structurellement nos économies, nos économies et en général pour les transformer en marché de consommation de biens produits ailleurs. 
Donc historiquement, et c'est un point sur lequel j'aimerais un peu revenir, euh, il y a eu plusieurs vagues de tentatives par les pays en voie de développement pour construire des systèmes permettant de répondre aux besoins financiers et de liquidités en devise étrangère, tout en évitant au maximum les prêts conditionnés du FMI. Donc il y a eu plusieurs vagues dans l'histoire euh, de tentatives. Donc la première vague, elle a eu lieu, souvent c'est pendant les crises, donc la première vague, elle a eu lieu euh, après la crise du pétrole dans les années 70, avec la création du Fonds monétaire arabe et du Fonds de réserve pour l'Amérique latine. La seconde vague a lieu après la crise asiatique à la fin des années 90, donc suite aux réformes du FMI, les pays asiatiques ayant goûté aux, aux, aux potions du FMI, ont eu l'idée de créer un réseau euh, décentralisé d'accords bilatéraux d'échange de devises entre pays asiatiques, donc ce qu'on appelle en anglais « bilateral swap agreements ». Donc l'idée c'était de créer comme ça voilà, des accords entre chaque pays euh, où ils avaient accès à des, à, à des, à des devises euh, au moment où ils en avaient besoin lors d'une crise. Donc ce qui est intéressant avec, avec cette initiative, c'est qu'elle n'est pas du tout centralisée comme c'est le cas avec le Fonds monétaire arabe et le Fonds de réserve pour l'Amérique latine, mais il y a eu une tentative de centralisation et de multilatéralisation de ce réseau à travers ce qu'on a appelé l'initiative Chiang Mai. Donc l'idée, c'était justement de recentraliser un peu, un peu ces, 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 ce réseau décentralisé d'accords bilatéraux, mais à la condition que, au delà d'un certain pourcentage de quotas de chaque pays, le pays doit obtenir un accord de prêt du FMI. Au début, c'était 20%, puis ensuite, ça a été augmenté à 30%, 40%. Et ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'aucun pays asiatique n'a utilisé le nouvel outil, donc l'initiative de Chiang Mai, principalement justement pour ne pas avoir à, à respecter la condition de devoir passer par le FMI. Tout ça pour dire que jusqu'à présent, les pays continuent à utiliser le réseau décentralisé et ne passent pas par, disons, l'initiative Chiang Mai centralisée euh, du fait de la conditionnalité de passer par le FMI. La troisième vague qui a eu lieu, c'est pendant la crise de 2008, avec la création de fonds régionaux, donc principalement le mécanisme européen de stabilisation en Europe, et le fonds eurasiatique pour la stabilisation et le développement en Asie plutôt. Euh, centrale, mais il y a eu aussi quelque chose d'assez intéressant, c'est qu'après la crise de 2008, il y a eu le, la banque centrale américaine qui a lancé des accords bilatéraux d'échange de dollars avec les pays alliés dans une très forte proportion, c'est-à-dire qu'il y a eu des quantités énormes qui ont été mises à disposition par la banque centrale américaine de manière bilatérale, sans condition, de telle sorte que aujourd'hui, enfin d'après les derniers chiffres qu'on a en 2018, les sources de liquidité au niveau global on se sont répartis de la manière suivante. Donc la capacité du FMI à mobiliser des ressources en dollars, elle est environ de 1000 milliards de dollars. Les accords financiers régionaux, comme le mécanisme, le mécanisme européen de stabilité, le fonds monétaire arabe, etc., aujourd'hui ont une capacité financière autour de 1000 milliards de dollars aussi. Donc c'est à peu près équivalent à celle du FMI. Et enfin, les accords, de, les accords bilatéraux d'échange de devises, donc les accords de swap bilatéraux, ont une capacité et une force de frappe qui est de 1500 milliards de dollars. Donc qu'est-ce que ça veut dire Ça veut dire que le FMI aujourd'hui n'est plus le seul acteur qui est capable de fournir des liquidités en masse aux pays qui en ont besoin lors d'une crise. Et donc d'autres alternatives existent. Cependant, ce qu'on voit au niveau géographique, c'est que par exemple les pays d'Afrique subsaharienne n'ont généralement accès uniquement qu'au FMI. Ils n'ont pas accès à des accords financiers régionaux, ils n'ont pas accès à des accords de swap bilatéraux. Pour les pays arabes d'Amérique latine, ils ont accès aussi au FMI, mais aussi ils ont accès à des accords financiers régionaux, mais ces accords, de, les accords financiers régionaux, que ce soit le Fonds monétaire arabe ou le, le Fonds de réserve d'Amérique pour l'Amérique latine, ont un volume assez faible qui ne permet pas de répondre aux besoins. On sait que pendant Covid, par exemple, le Fonds de réserve d'Amérique latine a augmenté sa capacité à financer. Par contre, le Fonds monétaire arabe, d'après mes informations, n'a pas augmenté sa capacité pendant la crise de Covid. Ainsi, si on regarde ces leçons d'alternatives au FMI, on se rend compte que les pays africains ont intérêt à accélérer l'opérationnalisation du Fonds monétaire euh, africain. Donc on sait qu'il y a le Fonds monétaire africain qui est déjà, euh, disons, euh, sur le papier déjà défini, des quotas sont déjà définis pour des pays, mais, disons, les mécanismes de financement doivent s'assurer qui ne soit pas conditionné au passage par des programmes avec le PFMI, comme ça a été le cas par exemple avec l'initiative de Chiang Mai, où les pays ne l'ont pas utilisé. On pourrait s'inspirer par exemple de deux expériences, celle du, du Fonds 
de réserve pour l'Amérique latine, où ils ont réussi à mettre en place un fonds, même si les volumes sont faibles, où les pays ont utilisé ces, ces fonds parce qu'ils se sont appropriés cet outil et il n'y avait pas de conditionnalité avec le FMI, donc ils ont permis de répondre partiellement à leurs besoins. Mais surtout, s'inspirer de l'expérience asiatique et notamment la mise en place d'un réseau multiple d'accords bilatéraux décentralisés pour répondre à leurs besoins en cas de crise de, de, en, en cas de, crise de liquidité et pour sortir aussi des conditionnalités du FMI pour pouvoir augmenter, euh, disons, leur, leur espace politique et budgétaire et choisir leur propre voie. Voilà. Merci. Thank you so much, Shafiq, for this important intervention on monetary policy and fiscal space. Uh, so now we move from the monetary policy uh, discussions to uh, a discussion on approaches to social and political unity. And I present to you Faisal Gerba from the University of Cape Town. Uh, Faisal is also a researcher with the Post-Colonialism Today project. In his intervention today, he will be drawing lessons um, on building a shared political community, particularly as the COVID-19 crisis has heightened the incidence of xenophobia. Uh, Hiba for the introduction. Uh, as Hiba said, the title of my talk is Migration and Xenophobia, Lessons from a Shared Political Community. Now, although my research for the project was looking at two historical moments, mainly Ghana and Tanzania in the immediate post-colonial period, it has relevance for countries across the continent today. Because the question, how do you create a coherent society where people from different origins could be united by material conditions and the aspiration for a different, more equitable future is one that every country on the African continent is confronted with today. And indeed the research is even more relevant today in view of the impacts of the coronavirus disease across Africa. As we speak, the rate of infection is increasing by the day. The impact of coronavirus is largely on the poor and working class. And this is from actual rates of infection to loss of employment and the collapse of small businesses on which many poor and working class people in Africa subsist. These are the categories of people who do not have the luxury to work from home. You know, as we are doing right now, having this webinar, we speaking, and you colleagues joining us for discussions, <laughs> particularly hit by the coronavirus pandemic, are migrants, refugees, and displaced persons who do not have the familial network that can support them in moments where regular means of livelihood is no longer accessible. While some states on the continent have rolled out relief packages for the most vulnerable in the form of uh, food vouchers, uh, non-citizens and migrants are excluded from these uh, relief packages. Displaced persons and refugees, for example, um, who are not catered for by the UNHCR, have no place in the relief packages across the continent. So the question of solidarity therefore becomes important here because as COVID bites, we are also seeing mobilizations along nationalist uh, 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 tendencies that seek to identify those who do not belong, not just to deny them access to basic necessity, but to actually victimize them as you know, those who undermine our effort to tackle this uh, pandemic. Across Africa, for example, recently in Ghana, there were some uh, reports of quote-unquote Nigerians uh, who uh, were infected with the virus but refused to report themselves to the authorities for quarantine, right? So these narratives, in a sense, identify people, most of whom are incredibly vulnerable uh, in these moments, uh, and try to, to victimize them. 
And therefore, the question of solidarity becomes important here. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis is revealing that exclusion is not a way out. Because if one segment of society is excluded or denied access to food or running water, which we know is an essential uh, component of the fight against COVID, um, if this uh, essential component of the fight against COVID is denied people on the basis of their citizenship, um, actually the entire society is placed at risk because what will eventually happen is that a vector for the expansion of the disease is being cultivated by this exclusion, which will later undermine any effort at curbing the spread of the disease. Now, coronavirus also reveals the limits of our chosen path on the continent, which is uh, an unbridled individualism uh, that marks our current uh, neoliberal state. Um, and this is closely followed by a certain narrow nationalist outlook uh, that many states have adopted. The interesting thing, though, is that this narrow nationalist outlook is in complete contradiction with the reality of constant mobility across the African continent. Over the past 30 years, for example, we know that movement across Africa has increased, and this is closely linked with the complete discretion uh, 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 of the capacity of, of states to provide for people's uh, basic necessity. This effectively results in the inability of people to meet their basic needs and therefore um, initiate waves of movement in search of livelihood. But I also want to emphasize that migration on the African continent has always been the norm. The livelihood structures in Africa have always been far flung. People move across sub-regions, not just within countries and across countries, but across sub-regions for hundreds of years. So migration is integral to the making of livelihood structures of Africa. It is this realization that um, led to many sub-regions in Africa to initiate protocols to manage the movement of people. So you have um, in ECOWAS, for example, the, 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 the free movement uh, protocol that allows people to move within West African countries uh, for 90 days to settle, but also to establish uh, businesses. You have the same thing in SADC in the Southern African sub-region. Now, what happens very often is that there is a contradiction between the provisions of these sub-regional uh, protocols and national legislations. Some national legislations carve out sections of the economy for only citizens and therefore contradict the provisions of uh, 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 sub-regional frameworks that allow citizens of all member states to move freely, settle and establish businesses in, in other member states. Now, I think um, the lessons uh, that my research brought to the fore in Ghana and Tanzania in the immediate uh, post-colonial period um, is that in order to build a nation, um, groups of uh, uh, people that were ruled as separate and even antagonistic entities by uh, colonial uh, rulers um, were brought together um, in order to forge a nation. Now, because the movements that led the anti-colonial struggles in both Ghana and Tanzania were made up of workers, peasants, the unemployed, and different categories of ordinary people in urban and rural areas, uh, from different ethnic um, identities, from diverse geographical origins, including people from other quote-unquote territories or colonial uh, dependencies or, 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 or possessions, the outlook of these movements were broad and all-inclusive. It meant that they did not proceed from the assumption that people were part of a society based on their ethnic origin. The making of the nation therefore privileged social transformation, commitment and livelihood 
over the colonial emphasis on origins and, and division. Solidarity and the needs of people uh, uh, are of central importance here because the notion of belonging is not based on autochtonity, on unchanging essence, but on residency and one's commitment. So here, citizenship uh, is something which is seen as a function of existence in the public sphere. It's not something which is seen as an ancestral right that some people are excluded from, you know, uh, by virtue of, of birth. <clears throat> now, I think if we draw on these lessons for today, I think in the midst of the coronavirus, states on the continent have to take the heterogeneity of their populace as the starting point. Migration, as I said earlier, is a norm and has always been a norm. So policies have to be driven by where states find themselves, what is the makeup of the population. We know, for example, that African states have become more heterogeneous than they ever were, right? Now, if a policy is to respond to this reality, then it cannot proceed from the notion that some people are eternal insiders while some people are eternal outsiders. Because I think coronavirus, more than actually the anti-colonial struggle, is showing the limits of exclusion. Because if anyone is excluded, everyone is at risk, right? Now, finally, I think the integration of the continent from below by ordinary migrants means that states have to expedite social security transferability and universal social services to everyone. This calls for taking seriously continent-wide policy initiatives anchored on solidarity and Pan-African thinking, as opposed to instrumentalist competition between uh, countries. So I think my, my time is up. I will stop here uh, for, for, for a conversation with uh, uh, colleagues. Thank you, Faisal, for this very relevant intervention. Uh, we have come to the end of our webinar, and I would like to thank you all for tuning in uh, to our first uh, webinar today, and to remind you that this is the first of a series of webinars uh, that bring to you the findings of the research that was done as part of the Postcolonialisms Today project. So please um, stay in the loop and join us for the upcoming webinars. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.